Good King Wenceslas looked out on the feast of Stephen. When the snow lay round about, deep and crisp and even. Well, hello there, and welcome to day nine of the 12 Days of Crabwood. Today, we have some more fun. Today, we're going to start with a story called Christmas on Wheels by Willis Boyd Allen. He lived from 1855 to 1938, and you may have never heard of him, but that's probably has more to do with the fact because his writing was for children more than anything else. But during his lifetime, he was a very popular author with more than 30 books in his pantheon. So even though this was written in 1895, this short story struck me as remarkably modern sounding, like so many of ours this year, not just because of the language that was used, but also the sub-references he makes. Listen for the now is the winter of our discontent joke, just for one. And our Christmas on Wheels will stop off to visit Samuel McCord Crothers again with a different kind of essay from yesterday's, but one that when I read it, I couldn't help thinking it was written for our time. There was one reference, though, that was completely lost on me that I had to go look up. It's Sartor Resartus. This is a reference to a book by Thomas Carlyle that translates roughly to The Tailor Retailored. Finding this out was a rabbit hole that I really enjoyed going down. But for our purposes today, I'm going to put a link in the show notes so you can go down the rabbit hole yourself. The only thing I think that you need to know before we listen is that Carlyle was influenced by A Tale of a Tub by Jonathan Swift and by Tristram Shandy by Lawrence Stern. So the short version of that is they're meta writers. They're very modern. They're hilarious. They were well before their time in their sharp eye for social commentary and their modest proposals on how to fix things. So Sartor Resartus. It may even show up on Craftlet one day. But back to Christmas. After Samuel McCord Crothers' essay, we will end with another request from a Craftlet listener. Brigid requested a story by Ruth Sawyer that is named differently in other places. So one version of it is Barney's Tale of the Wee Red Cap or The Voyage of the Wee Red Cap. And it was published in her book, This Way to Christmas, in 1916, which means this was written during World War I. And I think that shows. It's a semi-Scrooge story that's set on St. Stephen's Day. And St. Stephen's Day is referenced in Good King Wenceslas, which was, is a feast day. And my understanding is that it is specifically one of those feast days where we're supposed to do for those who have less than we do to give, to open our hearts, our homes, our dinner tables to those who are less lucky than we are. Tis the season. All right, let's listen to our three goodies for today. Here we go. Christmas on Wheels by Willis Boyd Allen, read in English. One. A railroad station in a large city is hardly an inviting spot at its best, but at the close of a cheerless, blustering December day, when biting draughts of wind come scurrying in at every open door, filling the air with a grey compound of dust and fine snow, when passengers tramp up and down the long platform, waiting impatiently for their trains, when newsboys wander about with disconsolate red faces, hands in pockets, and bundles of unsold papers under their ragged and shivering arms, when, in general, humankind presents itself as altogether a frozen, forlorn, discouraged, and hopeless race, condemned to be swept about on the nipping, dusty wind like Francesca and her lover at the rate of thirty miles an hour, then the station becomes positively unendurable so thought bob estabrook as he paced to and fro in the boston and albany depot travelling bag in hand on just such a night as i have described beside him locomotives puffed and plunged and backed on the shining rails as if they too felt compelled to trot up and down to keep themselves warm and in even tolerably good humour just my luck growled bob with a misanthropic glare at a loud-voiced family who were passing christmas coming 
two jolly brighton parties and an oratorio thrown up and here i am i fired off to san francisco so much for being junior member of a law firm wonder what here the ruffled current of his meditations ran plump against a rock and as suddenly diverged from its former course the rock was no less than a young person who at that moment approached with a grey-haired man and inquired the way to the ticket office just beyond the waiting-room on the right replied bob pointing to the office and lifting his hat courteously in response to the lady's question he watched them with growing interest as they followed his directions and stood before the lighted window the two silhouettes were decidedly out of the common the voice whose delicate tone still lingered pleasantly about mr robert estabrook's fastidious ears was an individual voice as distinguishable from any other he remembered as was the owner's bright face the little fur collar beneath it the daintily gloved hands and the pretty brown travelling suit dignified old fellow mused bob irrelevantly as the couple moved toward the train gates probably her father perhaps hello by george they're going on my car with which breath of summer in his winter of discontent the young man proceeded to finish his cigar consult his watch and as the last warning bell rang step upon the platform of the already moving pullman it must be admitted that as he entered he gave an expectant glance down the aisle of the car but the sombre curtains hanging from ceiling to floor told no tales too sleepy to speculate and too learned in the marvellous acoustic properties of a sleeping car to engage the porter in conversation on the subject he found his berth arranged himself for the night with the nonchalance of an old traveller and laying his head upon his vibrating atom of a pillow was soon plunged into a dream at least fifty miles long two it was snowing and snowing hard moreover it had been snowing all night and all the afternoon before the wind rioted furiously over the broad missouri plains alternately building up huge castles of snow and throwing them down again like a fretful child overtaking the belated teamster on his homeward journey clutching him with its icy hand and leaving him buried in a tomb spotless as the fairest marble howling shrieking racing madly to and fro never out of breath always the same tireless pitiless awful power rocks fields sometimes even forests were blotted out of the landscape a mere hyphen upon the broad white page lay the western bound train held fast by the soft but firm hand the fires in the locomotives there were two of them had been suffered to go out the fuel in the tenders was exhausted and the great creatures waited silently together left alone in the storm while the snow drifted higher and higher upon their patient backs when bob had waked that morning to find the tempest more furious than ever and the train stuck fast in a huge snowbank his first thought was of dismay at the possible detention in the narrow limits of the pullman which seemed much colder than it had before his next was to wonder how the change of fortune would affect gertrude raymond of course he had long ago become acquainted with the brown travelling suit and fur collar of course there had been numberless little services for him to perform for her and the old gentleman who had indeed proved to be her father bob had already begun to dread the end of the journey he had gone to his berth the night before wishing that san francisco were ten days from boston instead of six providence having taken him at his word and indicated that the journey would be of at least that duration if not more he was disposed like no few of his fellow mortals to grumble once more he became misanthropic there's miss raymond now he growled to himself knocking his head savagely against the upper berth in his attempt to look out through the frosty pane sitting over against the aisle day after day with her kid gloves and all that nice enough of course 
recalling one or two spirited conversations where hours had slipped by like minutes but confoundedly useless like the rest of em if she were like mother now there'd be no trouble she'd take care of herself but as it is the whole car will be turned upside down for her to-day for fear she'll freeze or starve or spoil her complexion or something here bob turned an extremely cold shoulder on the window and having performed a sort of horizontal toilette emerged from his berth his hair on end and his face expressive of utter defiance to the world in general and contempt of fashionable young ladies in particular at that moment miss raymond appeared in the aisle sweet and rosy as a june morning her cheeks glowing and her eyes sparkling with fun good morning mr estabrook she said demurely settling the fur collar about her neck bob endeavoured to look dignified and was conscious of failure good morning he replied with some stiffness and a shiver which took him by surprise it was cold jumping out of that warm berth i understand we must stay but don't let me detain you she added with a sly glance at his hair bob turned and marched off solemnly to the masculine end of the car washed in ice-water completed his toilette and came back refreshed breakfast was formally served as usual and then a council of war was held conductor engineers and brakemen being consulted and inventories taken it was found that while food was abundant the stock of wood in the bins would not last till noon there were twelve railroad men and thirty-five passengers on board some twenty of the latter being emigrants in a second class behind the two pullmans the little company gathered in the snowbound car looked blankly at each other some of them instinctively drawing their wraps more tightly about their shoulders as if they already felt the approaching chill it was miles to the nearest station in either direction above below on all sides was the white blur of tumultuous wind-lashed snow the silence was broken pleasantly once more bob felt the power of those clear sweet tones the men must make up a party to hunt for wood she said while you're gone we women will do what we can for those who are left the necessity for immediate action was evident and without further words the council broke up to obey her suggestion a dozen men looking like amateur esquimaux and floundering up to their armpits at the first step started off through the drifts one of the trainmen who knew the line of the road thoroughly was sure they must be near a certain clump of trees where plenty of wood could be obtained taking the precaution to move in single line one of the engineers a broad-shouldered six-footer leading the way and steering by compass they were soon out of sight as they struck off at right angles to the track bob thought he recognized a face pressed close to the pane and watching them anxiously but he could not be sure two hours later the men appeared once more some staggering under huge logs some with axes some with bundles of lighter boughs for kindling in another five minutes smoke was going up cheerily from the whole line of cars for the trees had proved to be less than a quarter of a mile distant and the supply would be plentiful before night when bob estabrook stamped into his own car hugging up a big armful of wood he was a different-looking fellow from the trim young lawyer who was wont to stand before the jury seats in the boston courthouse he had on a pair of immense blue yarn mittens loaned by a kindly brakeman his face was scratched with refractory twigs his eyebrows were frosted his moustache an icy caret the average tramp might well have hesitated before acknowledging kinship with him his eyes roved through the length of the car as it had that first night in the depot she was not there he was as anxious as a boy for her praise guess i'll take it into the next car he said apologetically to the nearest passengers there's more coming just behind she was not in the second pullman of course she wasn't in the baggage car 
was it possible he entered the third and last car recoiling just a bit at the odour of crowded and unclean poverty which met him at the door sure enough there she sat his idle fashionable type of inutility with one frowsy child upon the seat beside her two very rumpled-looking boys in front and a baby with terracotta hair in her arms somehow the baby's hair against the fur collar didn't look so badly as you would expect either she seemed to be singing it to sleep and kept on with her soft crooning as she glanced up over the tangled red locks at snowy bob and his armful of wood with a look in her eyes that would have sent him cheerfully to alaska for more had there been need a few seats off i ought to say her father was talking kindly and earnestly to a rough-looking man and his wife the latter of whom wore the dear old gentleman's cloak fathers and daughters are apt to be pretty much alike in these things you see three with the cheerful heat of the fires the kind offices of nearly all the well-dressed people to the poorer ones for they were not slow these kid-gloved pullman passengers to follow miss raymond's example the day wore on quietly and not unpleasantly toward its close then some one suddenly remembered that it was christmas eve dear me cried miss raymond delightedly reaching round the baby to clap her hands let's have a christmas party a few sighed and shook their heads as they thought of their own home firesides one or two smiled indulgently on the small enthusiast several chimed in at once conductor and baggage-master were consulted and the spacious baggage-car specially engaged for the occasion the originator of the scheme triumphantly announced preparations commenced without delay all the young people put their heads together in one corner and many were the explosions of laughter as the programme grew trunks were visited by their owners and small articles abstracted therefrom to serve as gifts for the emigrants and trainmen to whose particular entertainment the evening was by common consent to be devoted just as the lamps were lighted in the train our hero who had disappeared early in the afternoon returned dragging after him a small stunted pine tree which seemed to have strayed away from its native forests on purpose for the celebration on being admitted to the grand hall bob further added to the decorations a few strings of a queer mossy sort of evergreen hereupon a very young man with light eyebrows who had hitherto been inconspicuous suddenly appeared from the depths of a battered trunk over the edge of which he had for some time been bent like a siphon and with a beaming face produced a box of veritable tiny wax candles he was on the road he explained for a large wholesale toy shop and these were samples he guessed he could make it all right with the firm of course the affair was a great success i have no space to tell of the sheltered walk that bob constructed of rugs from car to car of the beautified interior of the old baggage car draped with shawls and brightened with bits of ribbon of the mute wonder of the poor immigrants a number of whom had but just arrived from germany and could not speak a word of english of their unbounded delight when the glistening tree was disclosed and the cries of weihnachtsbaum weihnachtsbaum from their rumpled children whose faces waked into a glow of blissful recollection at the sight ah if you could have seen the pretty gifts the brave little pine which all the managers agreed couldn't possibly have been used had it been an inch taller the improvised tableau wherein bob successively personated an organ-grinder a pug-dog and hamlet amid thunders of applause from the brakemen and engineers then the passengers sang a simple christmas carol miss raymond leading with her pure soprano and bob chiming in like the diapason of an organ just as the last words died away a sudden hush came over the audience could it be an illusion or did they hear the muffled but sweet notes of a church bell faintly sounding without 
tears came into the eyes of some of the roughest of the emigrants as they listened and thought of a wee belfry somewhere in the fatherland where the christmas bells were calling to prayers that night the sound of the bells ceased and the merriment went on while the young man with eyebrows lighter than ever but with radiant face let himself quietly into the car unnoticed it had been his own thought to creep out into the storm clear away the snow from the nearest locomotive bell and ring it while the gaiety was at its height all this indeed there was and more but to bob the joy and sweetness of the evening centred in one bright face what mattered it if the wind roared and moaned about the lonely snow-drifted train while he could look into those brown eyes and listen to that voice for whose every tone he was fast learning to watch well the blockade was raised and the long railroad trip finished at last but two of its passengers at least have agreed to enter upon a still longer journey four she says it all began when he came staggering in with his armful of wood and his blue mittens and he he doesn't care at all when it began he only realizes the joy that has come to him and believes that after a certain day next may it will be christmas for him all the year round end of christmas on wheels by willis boyd allen good king wenceslas looked out on the feast of stephen when the snow lay round about deep and crisp and even brightly shone the moon that night though the frost was cruel when a poor man came in sight gathering winter fuel hither page and stand by me if thou knowst it telling yonder peasant who is he where and what his dwelling sire he lives a goodly what makes the book so cross asked the youngest listener who had for a few minutes for lack of anything better to do been paying some slight attention to the reading that was intended for her elders it was a question which we had not been bright enough to ask. We had been plodding on with the vague idea that it was a delightful book. Certainly the subject was agreeable. The writer was taking us on a ramble through the less frequented parts of Italy. He had a fine descriptive power and made us see the quiet hill towns, the old walls, the simple peasants, the white Umbrian cattle in the fields. It was just the sort of thing that should have brought peace to the soul. But it didn't. The author had the trick of rubbing his subject the wrong way. Everything he saw seemed to suggest something just the opposite. When every prospect pleased, he took offense at something that wasn't there. He was himself a favored man of leisure, and he could go where he pleased and stay as long as he liked. Instead of being content with a short, pharisaic prayer of thanksgiving that he was not as other men, he turned to berate the other men who in New York were at that very moment rushing up and down the crowded streets in the frantic haste to be rich. He treated their fault as his misfortune. Indeed, it was unfortunate that the thought of their haste should spoil the serenity of his contemplation. His fine sense for the precious in art led him to seek the untrodden ways. He indulged in bitter jibes at the poor taste of the crowd. In some faraway church, just as he was getting ready to enjoy a beautifully faded picture on the wall, he caught sight of a tourist. He was only a mild-mannered man with an apologetic air, as one who would say, Let me look too, I mean no harm. It was a meek effort at appreciation, but to the gentleman who wrote the book it was an offense. Here was a spry from the crowd, an emissary of the modern by and by the whole pack would be in full cry, and the lovely solitude would be no more. Then the author wandered off through the olives, where under the unclouded Italian sky he could see the long line of the Apennines, and there he meditated on the insufferable smoke of Sheffield and Pittsburgh. 
The young critic was right. The author was undoubtedly cross. In early childhood, this sort of thing is well understood and called by its right name. When a small person starts the day in a contradictory mood and insists on taking everything by the wrong handle, he is not allowed to flatter himself that he is a superior person with a temperament or a fine thinker with a gift for righteous indignation. He is simply set down as cross. It is presumed that he got up the wrong way, and he is advised to try again and see if he cannot do better. If he is fortunate enough to be thrown into the society of his contemporaries, he is subjected to a course of salutary discipline. No mercy is shown to the cross patch. He cannot present his personal grievances to the judgment of his peers, for his peers refuse to listen. After a while, he becomes conscious that his wrath defeats itself, as he hears the derisive couplet, Johnny's mad and I am glad. What's the use of being unpleasant any longer if it only produces such unnatural gaiety in others? At last, as a matter of self-defense, he puts on the armor of good humor, which alone is able to protect him from the assaults of his adversaries. But when a person has grown up and is able to express himself in literary language, he is freed from these wholesome restraints. He may indulge in peevishness to his heart's content, and it will be received as a sort of esoteric wisdom. For we are simple-minded creatures and prone to superstition. It is only a few thousand years since the alphabet was invented, and the printing press is still more recent. There is still a certain Delphic mystery about the printed page which imposes upon the imagination. When we sit down with a book, it is hard to realize that we are only conversing with a fellow being who may know little more about the subject in hand than we do, and who is attempting to convey to us not only his life philosophy, but also his aches and pains, his likes and dislikes, and the limitations of his own experience. When doleful sounds come from the oracle, we take it for granted that something is the matter with the universe, when all that has happened is that one estimable gentleman, on a particular morning, was out of sorts when he took pen in hand. At Christmas time, when we naturally want to be on good terms with our fellow men, and when our pursuit of happiness takes the unexpectedly genial form of plotting for their happiness, the disposition of our favorite writers becomes a matter of great importance to us. A surly, sour-tempered person, taking advantage of our confidence, can turn us against our best friends. If he has an acrid wit, he may make us ashamed of our highest enthusiasms. He may so picture human life as to make the message, peace on earth, goodwill to men, seem a mere mockery. I have a friend who has in him the making of a popular scientist, having an easy flow of extemporaneous theory, so that he is never closely confined to his facts. One of his theories is that pessimism is purely a literary disease, and that it can only be conveyed through the printed page. In having a single means of infection, it follows the analogy of malaria, which in many respects it resembles. No mosquito, no malaria, so no book, no pessimism. Of course, you must have a particular kind of mosquito, and he must have got the infection somewhere, but that is his concern, not yours. The important thing for you is that he is the middleman on whom you depend for the disease. In like manner, so my friend asserts, the writer is the middleman through whom the public gets its supply of pessimism. I am not prepared to give an unqualified assent to this theory, for I have known some people who were quite illiterate, who held very gloomy views. At the same time, it seems to me there is something in it. When an unbookish individual is in the dumps, he's conscious of his own misery, but he does not attribute it to all the world. The evil is narrowly localized. He sees the dark side of things because he is so unluckily placed that he alone is visible. But he is quite ready to believe that there is a bright side somewhere. I remember several pleasant half hours spent in front of a cabin on the top of a far western mountain. The proprietor of the cabin, who was known as Pat, had dwelt there in solitary happiness until an intruder came and settled nearby. There was incompatibility of temper, and a feud began. Henceforth, Pat had a grievance, and when a sympathetic traveler passed by, he would pour out the story of his woes, for, like the wretched man of old, he meditated evil on his bed against his enemy. 
And yet, as I have said, the half hours spent in listening to these tirades were not cheerless, and no bad effects followed. Pat never impressed me as being inclined to misanthropy. In fact, I think he might have been set down as one who loved his fellow men, always accepting the unlucky individual who lived next to him. He never imputed the sins of this particular person to all of humanity. There was always a sunny margin of good humor around the black object of his hate. In this respect, Pat was angry and sinned not. After listening to his vituperative eloquence, I would ride on in hopeful frame of mind. I had seen the worst and was prepared for something better. It was too bad that Pat and his neighbor did not get on better together, but this was an incident which did not shut out the fact that it was a fine day, and that some uncommonly nice people might live on the other side of the range. But if Pat had possessed a high degree of literary talent, and had written a book, I'm sure the impression would have been quite different. Two loveless souls living on top of a lonely mountain, with the pitiless stars shining down on their futile hate. What theme could be more dreary? After reading the first chapter, I should be miserable. This, I should murmur, is life. There are two symbolic figures, Pat and the other. The artist, with relentless sincerity, refuses to allow our attention to be distracted by the introduction of any characters unconnected with the sordid tragedy. Here is human nature, stripped of all its pleasant illusions. What a poor creature is man! Pat and his neighbor, having become characters in a book, are taken as symbols of humanity, just as the scholastic theologians argued in many learned volumes that Adam and Eve, being all that there were at the time, should be treated as all mankind, at least for purposes of reprobation. The author who is saddest when he writes takes us at a disadvantage. He may assert that he is only telling us the truth. If it is ugly, that is not his fault. He pictures to us the thing he sees and declares that if we could free ourselves from our sentimental preference for what is pleasing, we should praise him for his fidelity. In all this, the author is well within his rights. But if he prefers unmitigated gloom in his representations of life, we on our part have the right of not taking him too seriously. Speaking of disillusion, we too can play at that game. We must get over our too romantic attitude towards literature. We must not exaggerate the significance of what is presented to us and treat that which is of necessary, necessity partial as if it were universal. When we are presented with a poor and shabby world, peopled only with sordid self-seekers, we need not be unduly depressed. We take the thing for what it is, a fragment. We are not looking directly at the world, but only at so much of it as has been mirrored in one particular mind. The mirror is not very large, and there is an obvious flaw in it, which more or less distorts the image. Still, let us be thankful for what is set before us, and make allowance for the natural human limitations. In this way, one can read almost any sincere book, not only with profit, but with a certain degree of pleasure. Let us remember that only a very small amount of good literature falls within Shelley's definition of poetry as the record of the best and happiest moments of the happiest and best minds. For these rare outpourings of joyous, healthy life, we are duly thankful. They are to be received as gifts of the gods, but we must not expect too many of them. Even the best minds often leave no record of their happiest moments, while they become garrulous over what displeases them. The cave of Adullam has always been the most prolific literary center. Every man who has a grievance is fiercely impelled to self-expression. He is not content till his grievance is published to the unheeding world, and it is well that it is so. We should be in a bad way if it were not for these inspired Adullamites who prevent us from resting in slothful indifference to evil. Most writers of decided individuality are inclined by a more or less iconoclastic impulse. There's an old idol they want to smash, a conventional lie which they want to expose. It is the same impulse which moves almost every right-minded citizen, once or twice in his life, to write a letter of protest to the newspaper. Things are going wrong in the neighborhood, and he is impatient to set them right. 
There are enough real grievances, and the full expression of them is a public service. But the trouble is that anyone who develops a decided gift in that direction is in danger of becoming the victim of his own talent. Eloquent fault-finding becomes a mannerism. The original grievance loses its sharp outlines. As it were, it passes from the solid to the gaseous state. It becomes vast, pervasive, atmospheric. It is like the London fog enveloping all objects and causing the eyes of those who peer through it to smart. This happened in the last generation to Carlyle and Ruskin, and to a certain degree to Matthew Arnold. Each had his group of enthusiastic disciples who responded eagerly to their master's call. They renounced shams or machine-made articles or middle-class Philistinism, as the case might be. They went in for sincerity or Turner or sweetness and light with all the ardor of youthfulness and youthful neophytes, and it was good for them. But after a while they became, if not exactly weary in well-doing, at least a little weary of the un intermittent tirades against ill-doing. They were in the plight of the good Christian who goes to church every Sunday only to hear the parson rebuke the sins of the people who are not there. The man who dated in his moral awakening from Sartor or Sartus began to find latter-day pamphlets wear on his nerves. It is good to be awakened, but one does not care to have the rising bell rung in his ears all day long. One must have a little ease, even in Zion. Ruskin had a real grievance, and so had Matthew Arnold. It is too bad that so much modern work is poorly done, and it is too bad that the middle-class Englishman has a number of limitations that are quite obvious to his candid friends, and that his American cousin is no better. But when all this has been granted, why should one talk as if everything were going to the dogs? Why not put a cheerful courage on as we work for better things? Even the Philistine has his good points, and perhaps may be led where he cannot be driven. At any rate, he is not likely to be improved by scolding. I'm beginning to feel the same way even about Ibsen. Time was when he had an uncanny power over my imagination. He had the wand of a disenchanter. Here, I said, is one who has the gift of showing us the thing as it is. There is not a single one of these characters whom we have not met. Their poor shifts at self-deceit are painfully familiar to us. In the company of this keen-eyed detective, we can follow human selfishness and cowardice through all their disguises. The emptiness of conventional respectabilities and pieties and the futility of the spasmodic attempts at heroism are obvious enough. It was an eclipse of my faith in human nature. The eclipse was never total, because the shadow of the book could not quite hide the thought of various men and women whom I had actually known. After a while I began to recover my spirits. Why should I be so depressed? This is a big world, and there is room in it for many embodiments of good and evil. There are all sorts of people. And the existence of the bad is no argument against the existence of quite another sort. Let us take realism in literature for what it is and no more. It is at best only a description of an infinitesimal bit of reality. The more minutely accurate it is, the more limited it must be in its field. You must not expect to get a comprehensive view through a high-powered microscope. The author is severely limited, not only by his choice of a subject, but by his temperament and by his opportunities for observation. He is doing us a favor when he focuses our attention upon one special object and makes us see it clearly. It is when the realistic writer turns philosopher and begins to generalize that we must be on our guard against him. He is likely to use his characters as symbols, and the symbolism becomes oppressive. There are some businesses which ought not to be united. They hinder healthful competition and produce a hateful monopoly. Thus, in some states, the railroads that carried coal also went into the business of coal mining. This has been prohibited by law. It is held that the railroad, being a common carrier, must not be put into a position in which it will be tempted to discriminate 
in favor of its own products. For a similar reason, it may be argued that it is dangerous to allow the dramatist or novelist to furnish us with a philosophy of life. The chances are that instead of impartially fulfilling the duties of a common carrier, he will foist upon us his own goods and force us to draw conclusions from the samples of human nature he has in stock. I should not be willing to accept a philosophy of life even from so accomplished a person as Mr. Bernard Shaw. It is not because I doubt his cleverness in presenting what he sees, but because I have a suspicion that there are some very important things which he does not see, or which do not interest him. It is really much more satisfactory for each one to gather his life philosophy from his own experience, rather than from what he reads out of a book, or from what he sees on the stage. The harvest of a quiet eye is, after all, more satisfying than the occasional discoveries of the unquiet eye that seeks only the brilliantly novel. The inevitable discrepancy between the literary representations of life and life itself has been the cause of an ancient feud between teachers of morals and writers of fiction. Because of this, Plato would banish poets from his Republic, and the Puritans would exclude novelists and play actors from their conventicles. But it is curious to observe how the character of the complaints varies with the change in literary fashions. The argument of serious persons against works of fiction used to be that they put too many romantic ideas into the reader's head. This was the charge made by Mrs. Tabitha Tenney, one of the first of a long line of American novelists. She wrote a novel entitled Female Quixotism, exhibited in the romantic opinions and extravagant adventures of Dorcasina Sheldon. The work was addressed to all the Columbian young ladies who read novels and romances. To these young ladies, the solemn advice of Mrs. Tabitha Tenney was, don't. Miss Dorcasina was certainly a distressing example. At the age of three years, this child had the misfortune to lose an excellent mother whose advice would have been pointed out to her the plain, rational path of life and prevented her imagination from being filled with the airy delusions and visionary dreams of love and raptures, darts, fires, and flames, with which the indiscreet writers of that fascinating kind of book denominated novels fill the heads of artless young girls to their great injury and sometime to their utter ruin. Her father allowed her to indulge her fancy, never considering their dangerous tendency to a young, inexperienced female mind. The various calamities into which Miss Dorcasina Sheldon fell may be imagined by those who have not the patience to search for them upon the printed page. Her parting words to those who had the guardianship of female minds had great solemnity. Withhold from their eyes the pernicious volumes which, while they convey false ideas of life and inspire illusory expectations, will tend to keep them ignorant of everything worth knowing, and which, if they do not eventually render them miserable, may at least prevent them from becoming respectable. Suffer not their imaginations to be filled with ideas of happiness, particularly in the connubial state, which can never be realized. If Mrs. Tabitha Tenney were to come to life in our day, I think she would hardly feel like warning the Colombian young ladies against the effect of works of fiction in exaggerating the happiness of life in general, or of the connubial state in particular. The young ladies are much more in danger of having their spirits depressed by the painstaking representation of miseries they are never likely to experience. The gloomy views of the average human nature, which once were conscientiously expounded by painful preachers, are now taken up by painful playwrights and storytellers. Under the spell of powerful imaginations, it is quite possible to see this world as nothing but a veil of tears. Happily, there is always a way of escape for those who are quick-witted enough to think of it in time. When fiction offers us only arid actualities, we can flee from it into the romance of real life. I sympathize with a young philosopher of my acquaintance. He took great joy in a jack-o'-lantern. The ruddy countenance of the pumpkin was the very picture of geniality. Goodwill gleamed from the round eyes, and the mouth was one luminous smile. No wonder that he asked the privilege of taking it to bed with him. He shouted gleefully when it was left on the table. 
But when he was alone, Mr. Jack-o'-lantern assumed a more grimly realistic aspect. There was something sinister in the squint of his eye, and uncanny in the way his rubicund nose gleamed. On entering the room a little while after, I found it in darkness. What has become of your jack-o'-lantern? He was making faces at me. I looked at him till I got most scared, so I just got up and blew him out. I commended my philosopher for his good sense. It is the way to do with jack-o'-lanterns when they become unmannerly. And I believe that is the best way to treat distressing works of the imagination, though I know that their authors, who take themselves solemnly, will resent this advice. We can't blow out a reality just because it happens to make us miserable. We must face it. It is a part of the discipline of life. But a book or a play has no such right to domineer over us. Our own imagination has the first rights in its own home. If some other person's imagination intrudes and makes faces, it is our privilege to blow it out. Good King Wenceslas looked out on the feast of Stephen when the snow lay round about deep and crisp and even brightly shone the moon that night though the frost was cruel when a poor man came in sight gathering winter fuel hither Stand by me, if thou know'st it telling. Yonder peasant, who is he? Where and what his dwelling? Sire, he lives a good league. Hand. David watched the locked out fairy go forth into the dusk again. He had always supposed that fairies disappeared suddenly and mysteriously, but this was not so. The little gray furry figure hopped slowly across the patch of white in front of the window, bobbed and frisked, pricked up the alert little ears and swung his bushy tail after the fashion of any genuine squirrel, and then dove under the low hanging boughs of the nearest evergreens. As he disappeared, David felt an arm on his shoulder and turned to blink wonderingly into the face of Big Barney, bending over him and grinning. Well, well, who'd have thought to catch the Sandman making his rounds afore supper? What sent you to sleep, laddie? Asleep? David scoffed hotly at the accusation. I was no more asleep than you are, Barney. Why, do you know what I've just seen? What's been right here this very minute? Barney's grin broadened. Well, maybe now it was the locked-out fairy, for this was the old joke between them. Little did Barney dream that this time he had not only touched upon the real truth, but he had actually gripped it by the scruff of the neck, as he would have put it himself. David looked wise. He was trying to make up his mind just how to tell the wonderful news when Barney's next words held his tongue and sent the news scuttling back to his memory. And speaking of fairies, I was just asking Joanna, getting supper out yonder, did she mind the tale old Con the Tinker used to be telling back in the old country about his great uncle Tague and the wee red cap? Did Joanna ever tell you now about the fairy's red cap? David shook his head. It serves as an easy way of travel for them. You might almost call it their private Pullman car, Barney chuckled. You wait a minute, and I'll see is there time to tell the tale myself between now and supper. He was away to the kitchen, and back before David had much more than time enough to rub the gathering frost from the window pane and look out for a possible return of his fairy. Nothing was to be seen, however, but the snow and the trees and the trail of tiny footprints, and Big Barney was beside him in the window nook again with a mysterious, knowledgeable look on his face. Aye, there's time and light enough still in the west to see the tale through. He paused for an instant. You know, laddie, over in Ireland, they're not keeping Christmas the same as you do here. The poor, I mean. Tis generally the day after, since Stephen's day. Though sometimes tis since Stephen's Eve that they manage a bit of a feast and merry-making. Them that has little shares with them that has less. And afterward, the neighbours gather about the turf fire for a story-telling. Aye, many's the strange tale you will hear over in Ireland on one of them nights. 
And here's the tale old Con the Tinker used for to be telling about his great uncle Teague, the most close fisted man in all of Inniskillen. And here again is the tale as Barney retold it and David heard it as he sat in the window nook of the lodge at dusk hour, just seven days before Christmas. It was the eve of St. Stephen, and Teg sat alone by his fire with naught in his cupboard but a pinch of tea and a bare mixing of meal, and a heart inside of him as soft and warm as the ice on the bucket water outside the door. The turf was near burnt on the hearth, a handful of gold and cinders left, just, and Teg took to counting them greedily on his fingers. There's one, two, three, and four, and five, he laughed. Faith, there be more bits of real gold hid under the loose clay in the corner. It was the truth, and it was the scraping and scrooching for the last piece that had left Teg's cupboard bare of a Christmas dinner. Gold is better nor eating and drinking, and if you have not to give, there'll be not asked of ye. And he laughed again. He was thinking of the neighbors and the doles of food and piggins of milk that would pass over their thresholds that night to the vagabonds and paupers who were sure to come begging. And on the heels of that thought followed another. Who would be giving old Sean his dinner? Sean lived a stone's throw from Teg, alone in a wee tumbling cabin. And for a score of years past, Teg had stood on the doorstep of every Christmas Eve and, making a hollow of his two hands, had called across the road. Hey there, Sean, will you come over for a sup? And Sean had reached for his crutches, there being but one leg to him, and had come. Faith, said Teg, trying another laugh. Sean can fast for once. Twill be all the same in a month's time. And he fell to thinking of the gold again. A knock came to the door. Teg pulled himself down in his chair where the shadow would cover him and held his tongue. Teg? Teg? It was the widow O'Donnelly's voice. If you are there, open your door. I've not got the pay for the spriggin' this month, and the children are needin' food. But Teg put the leash on his tongue, and never stirred till he heard the tramp of her feet going on to the next cabin. Then he saw to it that the door was tight-barred. Another knock came, and it was a stranger's voice this time. The other cabins are filled. Not one but has its hearth crowded. Will you take us in, the two of us? The wind bites, mortal sharp. Not a morsel of food have we tasted this day. Master, will you take us in? But Teg sat on, a hold in his tongue, and the tramp of the stranger's feet passed down the road. Others took their place, small feet, running. It was the miller's wee Cassie, and she called out to him as she went by. Old Sean's watching for you. you you'll not be forgetting him, will you, Teg? And then the child broke into a song, sweet and clear as she passed down the road. Listen, all ye, it is the feast of St. Stephen. Mind that ye keep it this holy even. Open your door and greet ye the stranger, for ye mind that the wee lord had not but a manger. Feed ye the hungry, and rest ye the weary. This ye must do for the sake of our Mary. Tis well that ye mind ye who sit by the fire, that the Lord he was born in a dark and cold byre. Teg put his fingers deep in his ears. A million murthering curses on them that won't let me be. Can't a man try to keep what is his without being pestered by them has only idled and wasted their days? And then the strange thing happened. Hundreds and hundreds of wee lights began dancing outside the window, making the room bright, and hands of the clock began chasing each other round the dial, and the bolt of the door drew itself out. Slowly, without a creak or a cringe, the door opened, and in there trooped a crowd of the good people. Their wee green cloaks were folded close about them, and each carried a rush candle. 
Teig was filled with great wonderment entirely when he saw the fairies, but when they saw him, they laughed. <laughs> oh, we're taking the lonelier cabin this night, Teig, said they. You're the only man hereabouts with a empty hearth, and we're needing one. Without saying more, they bustled about the room making ready. They lengthened out the table and spread it and set it. More of the good people trooped in, bringing stools and food and drink. The pipers came last, and they sat themselves around the chimney piece, a blowing their chanters and trying the drones. The feasting began, and the pipers played, and never had Teg seen such a sight in his life. Suddenly, a wee man sang out, Clip clap, clip clap, I wish I had my re red cap and out of the air there tumbled the neatest cap Teg had ever laid his two eyes on. The wee man clapped it on his head, crying, I wish I was in Spain! And whist, up the chimney he went, away out of sight. It happened, just as I'm telling it. Another wee man called for his cap, and away he went after the first, and then another, and another, until the room was empty and Teg sat alone again. By my soul, said Teg, I'd like to travel like that myself. It's a grand saving of tickets and baggage, and you get to a place before you've had time to change your mind. Faith, there's no harm done if I try it. So he sang the fairy's rhyme, and out of the air dropped a wee cap for him. For a moment, the wonder had him, but the next he was clapping the, the cap on his head, crying, Spain! Then, whisht, up the chimney he went after the fairies, and before he had time to let out his breath, he was standing in the middle of Spain, and strangeness all about him. He was in a great city. The doorways of the houses were hung with flowers, and the air was warm and sweet with the smell of them. Torches burned along the streets. Sweetmeat sellers went about crying their wares, and on the steps of a cathedral crouched a crowd of beggars. What's the meaning of that? asked Teg of one of the fairies. They're waiting for those that are hearing mass. When they come out, they give half of what they have to those that have nothing, so that on this night of all the year there shall be no hunger and no cold. And then, far down the street came the sound of a child's voice, singing. Listen, all ye, tis the feast of St. Stephen. Mind that ye keep it this holy even. Curse it, said Teg. Can a song fly after ye? And then he heard the fairies cry, Holland! And he cried, Holland! Too! In one leap he was over France, and another over Belgium, and with the third he was standing by long ditches of water, frozen fast, and over them glided hundreds upon hundreds of lads and maids. Outside each door stood a wee wooden shoe, empty. Teg saw scores of them as he looked down the ditch of a street. What is the meaning of those shoes? he asked the fairies. Ye poor lad, answered the wee man next to him. Are ye not knowing anything? This is the gift night of the year, when every man gives to his neighbour. A child came to the window of one of the houses, and in her hand was a lighted candle. She was singing as she put the light down close to the glass, and Teg caught the words. Open your door and greet ye the stranger, for ye mind that the wee lord had not but a manger. Tis the devil's work! cried Teague, and he set the red cap more firmly on his head. I'm for another country. I cannot be telling you half the adventures Teague had that night, nor half the sights that he saw, but he passed by fields that held sheaves of grain for the birds, and doorsteps that held bowls of porridge for the wee creatures. He saw lighted trees, sparkling and heavy with gifts, and he stood outside the churches, and watched the crowds pass in, bearing gifts to the Holy Mother and Child. At last, the fairies straightened their caps and cried, Now for the great hall and the King of England's palace! Whist! And away they went, and Teg went after them, and the first thing he knew, he was in London, not an arm's length from the King's throne. 
Oh, it was a grander sight than he had seen in any other country. The hall was filled entirely with lords and ladies, and the great doors were open for the poor and the homeless to come in and warm themselves by the king's fire and feast from the king's table. And many a hungry soul did the king serve with his own hands. Those that had anything to give gave it in return. It might be a bit of music played on a harp or a pipe, or it might be a dance or a song, but more often it was a wish, just for good luck and safe keeping. Teg was so taken up with the watching that he never heard the fairies when they wished themselves off. Moreover, he never saw the wee girl that was fed and went laughing away, but he heard a bit of her song as she passed through the window. Feed ye the hungry, and rest ye the weary, this ye must do for the sake of our Mary. Then the anger had Teg. I'll stop your pestering tongue once and for all time! And, catching the cap from his head, he threw it after her. No sooner was the cap gone than every soul in the hall saw him. The next moment they were about him, catching at his coat and crying, Where's he from? What is he here? Bring him before the king! And Teg was dragged along by a hundred hands to the throne where the king sat. He was stealing food, cried one. He was stealing the king's jewels, cried another. He looks evil, cried a third. Kill him! And in a moment all the voices took it up and the hall rang with, Aye, kill him! Kill him! Teg's legs took to trembling, and fear put the leash on his tongue. But after a long silence, he managed to whisper, I, I have done no evil to no one. <laughs> no one. Maybe, said the king. But have you done good? Come, tell us, have you given aught to anyone this night? If you have, we will pardon ye. Not a word could Teg say. Fear tightened the leash, for he was knowing full well there was no good to him that night. Then ye must die, said the king. Will ye try hanging or beheading? <sighs> hanging, please, your majesty, said Teg. The guards came rushing up and carried him off, but as he was crossing the threshold of the hall, a thought sprang at him, and he held him. Uh, your Majesty, he called after him, will you grant me a last request? I will, said the king. Thank ye. Uh, 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 there's a wee red cap that I'm a mortal fond of, and I lost it a while ago. If I could be hung with it on, I would hang a a deal more comfortable. The cap was found and brought to Teg. Clip, clap, clip, clap for my wee red cap. I wish I was home, he sang. Up and over the heads of the dumbfounded guard he flew and whisked and away out of sight. When he opened his eyes again, he was sitting close by his own hearth with the fire burnt low. The hands of the clock were still. The bolt was fixed firm in his door. The fairy's lights were gone, and the only bright thing was the candle burning in old Sean's cabin across the road. A running of feet sounded outside, and then the snatch of a song. "'Tis well that ye mind ye who sit by the fire, that the Lord he was born in a dark and cold briar." "'Wait ye, whoever ye are!' And Teg was away to the corner, digging fast at the loose clay, as the terrier digs at a bone. He filled his hands full of the shining gold, then hurried to the door, unbarring it. The miller's wee Cassie stood there, peering at him out of the darkness. Take those to the widow O'Donnelly, do you hear? A and take the rest to the store. You tell Jamie to bring up all that he has that is eatable and drinkable. A a and say to the neighbours, you say, Teg's keeping the feast this night. Hurry now! Teg stopped a moment on the threshold until the tramp of her feet had died away. Then he made a hollow of his two hands and called across the road. Hey there, Sean! Will you come over for a sup? And hey there, the two of you. 
Will you come out for a sup? It was Joanna's cheery voice bringing David back from a strange country and stranger happenings. She stood in the open doorway, a lighted candle in her hand. You'd hurry faster if you knew what I had outside for supper. What would a wee lad say now to a bit of real Irish currant bread baked in the griddle and a bowl of chicken broth with dumplings? Christmas on wheels. Am I right? You would never know. You would never know when that was written. 1908. Ah, I love it. And then, as I mentioned yesterday, and as you may have noticed again today, Andrew read our second Crothers piece for us as well. My husband and author of the new murder mystery, uh, third book in the series. So you can go uh, take a look at the cat books. There's Cool for Cats, The Cat Came Back, and Cats in the Cradle. And that's the third one that just got released. If you want to see his mystery or any of his other writings, and you may be interested in some of them, especially the ones that have to do with uh, his time served on the school board during during the crazy years, and, and still, uh, you can go to Broken Hand all one word, brokenhand.substack.com. And there you can find, it's like a blog roll. You can find all of the things that he's written, including his proud announcement that he has released his third book. And you can get all of the links out from there as well. The other voice that you may or may not recognize uh, is Jonathan Uppelman. Jonathan read several times for us in a uh, the premium stream, he did our PG Woodhouse stories and and his voices showed up a couple other times. His father is also the Elizabeth Gaskell scholar who I spoke to before we did Jane Eyre. So you got to hear a little more Jonathan and hearing a little more Jonathan is always a good thing. The other awesome thing about Jonathan Uffelman is that he too is a writer and you can find out more of his things at uffelstuff.com. Yes, and we're linking out to that in the show notes as well. Uh, but one of the things that he has done is he has released his own book called The Lore Gatherers. And it's one of the reasons why I went to him when I needed somebody who could handle reading a bit of an Irish story. At his Uffle Stuff website, you can find his short writings, his essays, his illustrations of some of the short bits and also poems he has included in there fibs. These are poems based on the Fibonacci code. <laughs> so yeah, it's too bad. He's just not very bright. <clears throat> you know, we do what we can with what we've got. <laughs> so you can find the lore gatherers, uh, more information on the lore gatherers at his website, awfulstuff.com or on Amazon. One thing I didn't mention about Ruth Sawyer beforehand, but I wanted to make sure I, I mentioned uh, before I left. Ruth Sawyer was not just an educator, but she was also a librarian. She had a really, really interesting life in that um, she got to travel a lot more than and, and travel alone a lot more than I think most women did during her era. Uh, she was writing from the get-go and she actually was sent to Ireland twice in order to um, it seems like do some kind of ethnographic collection like Zora Neale Hurston did of, of people's stories in Ireland and that is where you probably noticed some of the Irish influence on today's story. The other thing that I thought was kind of cool is her daughter who is also a writer wound up marrying Richard McCloskey who is the author of make way for ducklings so all sorts of awesome all wrapped up in ruth sawyer if you like what we do here please consider liking and subscribing on itunes thumbs upping and subscribing on youtube you can visit patreon.com craftlit and become a patron of this art and you can always go to linktree L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E -E slash craftlet channel.
And from there, you can get links out to all of the social media, all of the places that Craftlet lives. It's it's a nice hub that you can go to to get all the stuff, all the good stuff. And I keep forgetting to mention, we also have a Facebook group with the loveliest group of people, as you might imagine. They're just awesome makers and readers and people who hadn't been readers before but are now i like that all right you take care of yourself have a great one i'll talk to you soon bye good king wences last looked out on the feast of stephen when the snow lay round about deep and crisp and shone the moon that night though the frost was cruel when a poor man came in sight gathering winter fuel hither page and stand by me if thou know'st it telling yonder peasant who is he where and what his dwell Against the four.